We greet our friends everywhere with Chapter 11 of Thunder in the Heather, the story of John Knox. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and is brought to you by the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Marjorie, if I hadn't have seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. After so much fear and bloodshed in England, Scotland is like a new world. And so it is with me. I can hardly believe it. Such leniency to Protestantism, even though the regent is a Catholic. And the young folks so ready for fresh ideas. Aye, and the refugees from England preaching everywhere. To think we wondered what might happen to us if we were married in Scotland. Marjorie... I begin to believe that Satan may be overthrown yet in this dear land. Please, God. I can hardly believe the change. (laughs) Uh, But then, I suppose John Knox has changed as well. You mean being married? I mean in what I feel burning to preach. I spent too long shouting about the old corruptions of the Kirk. Nobody could dispute with me on the truth of what I said, but I did not give the people anything positive to hang on to. I taught them what was wrong, but not what was right. The Kirk and Barrett found no fault with their preaching, John. Ah, wife, the days are waiting and exile are over for me. The times are ready for the sound of the trumpet and the thrust of the sword of God. enough, my Scottish brethren, to boycott the sacraments of the Mass. You must put something in their place, not just a substitute for want of something better, but the real thing. Aye, Amen. That's what we need. God does not give you the precious gift of election, does not make you his chosen servants, just so you may register your complaints against corruption. Have not even the abbots and friars protested for centuries against the evil of the Kirk. Your calling, brethren, is to nothing less than the restoration of the true church of Jesus Christ. The true church must be firmly and fully established in Scotland. In Scotland, Jesus Christ must be lifted up as head of his Kirk. And he will draw all men under himself. It is obedience to Jesus Christ and to him alone that every man is called to. May we all make our election sure. (laughs) Mr. Knox, Mr. Knox. Who is calling? Here, Mr. Knox. He sees us, Cunningham. Did you want to speak with me? Sir, I am Peter Clyde, Earl of Moray. This is Alexander Cunningham, Earl of Glencairn. I'm happy you were here to hear the preaching. It was a great pleasure to listen to your preaching, Mr. Knox. You are staying in Montrose for a few days, are you not, Mr. Knox? I am, with uh, Mr. John Erskine. Uh, Perhaps we may to walk along with you. You may. You've had great success in your public preaching since your return to Scotland, Mr. Knox. God is opening the hearts of the people. Just so. The cause of reform in Scotland is growing rapidly. You have done more to strengthen the Protestant party in our government than we've been able to do for years. I'm not a man to be getting mixed up in politics, gentlemen. God has called me to preach the gospel. I trust that from its propagation, corruption and greed will diminish in Scotland, uh, with even those in authority submitting themselves to the yoke of Christ. But that is not to me. I'm called to preach. Uh, We don't want to ask for your help, Mr. Knox. Uh, We come to offer ours. And uh, what kind of help are you offering me? Oh, it has come to our attention that the regent of Scotland has heard of your activities and feels you are too influential in Scotland to be permitted to preach freely. I have no fear of a lady's tongue. Uh, All the same, so many Scots have left off going to mass and paying tithes to the church that her bishops are alarmed and demand that she put a stop to you. Uh, Let her fancy French bishops demand all they like. The day will come when they leave this land with nothing to their names. That may be so, Mr. Knox. We pray God to speed the time. But you're going to be summoned to appear before the bishops at the Church of the Black Friars in Edinburgh. Uh, Does this mean I'm to be 
tried for heresy? We didn't know. It is possible that once you appear in Edinburgh, you'll be arrested. That is, if you go alone. Many of the most powerful nobles in Scotland support you, Mr. Knox. We are among that group, which would like to accompany you into Edinburgh. When the court bishops learn that you are come with a company of nobles, ready to protect you, they'll think carefully before they lay hands on you. And uh, when am I to go to Edinburgh? You will receive a royal summons by tomorrow, directing you to appear in church on the 15th of May. Well then, uh, I must make preparations for our journey. And I thank you, Earl Moray and Earl Glencairn, for your warning and your help. <laughs> we must have frightened the bishops out of their wits. <laughs> Aye, that we did with him sending out a messenger to meet us, saying it was not necessary to enter the gates of Edinburgh. <laughs> well, if they are alarmed at our approach, it must have terrified them to see our company riding through the streets of the city. <laughs> aye, aye. <laughs> and the crowds that gather to hear you preach, Mr. Knox. It was a great audience of Scots. Aye. You know, it may have been the Queen Regent herself that changed the order. That's true. It is common knowledge she does not like the interference of the bishops in her realm. She is trying hard enough to make the crown secure for her young daughter, the Queen Mary. Mm. Who, it is rumoured, is about to marry the Prince Royal of France and return to Scotland to rule. Mm, that will be a black day for Scotland if she marries a Frenchman. I hardly think she will. The Scots hate the French. It would be a poor way of starting off as Queen of the Scots. Mm. But the more I think of it... The more I feel that it wasn't the bishops that called the truce. It must have been the Queen Mother. I can see it makes a mighty of difference. Oh, but it does. If she is against her bishops, this would be the right time for you to write her a letter, Mr. Knox. And uh, why should I have dealings with that daughter of Rome? Because she wants to affirm the authority of the crown and bring peace in Scotland so that her daughter may be legally declared the Queen. You could let her know that as long as she supports the Roman Church, which all Scotland hates, there'll be no peace in this land. I know the haughty ways of queens and women. But she might listen to you, Mr. Knox. She knows that you have the ear of the people. Well, I've written enough letters in my life. I suppose one more will not make a difference. And I have a feeling it will have a good effect on her. Dear, I have not laughed so well in weeks. Uh, what is it that amuses you, madame? <laughs> you archbishop, we a sad tire. Oh, what is it? <laughs> it is a letter from one of my loyal subjects, Jean Knox, the heretic preacher. He suggests that it is my solemn duty to overthrow the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland. Oh, dear. You should never have cancelled his summons to Blackfriar. I should have been so well entertained. Uh, can it really be a jest? <laughs> Read it aloud. <clears throat> it may appear superficial and foolish that I, a man of base estate, should admonish a princess. And I doubt not that the rumours that have come to your ears of me have been such that if all reports were true, I would be unworthy to live on the earth. Yet by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, I am called to preach reform in the realm of Scotland, even as your grace also seeks uh, reformation. But it is vain, madame, to crave reformation where there is only corruption. It is for you to cleanse this land of corruption and establish the true reform and religion of Jesus Christ, so that all may live in safety and peace. <laughs> well, now, was there ever a ruler that had such subjects as I in this strange land? It does not seem so funny to me, madam. Perhaps this man should be silenced. 
<laughs> Let him pleach his head off if he wants. It is nothing to me. Uh, but uh, perhaps he will be an increasing disturbance in the land. You, uh, you would like to get rid of him, wouldn't you? It must make you squirm to hear the things he says about the very bad things in the church. <clears throat> Madame, I am your spiritual advisor. I must direct you to take care. The sins of the tongue, Madame, often seem insignificant, yet they are of the greatest import. You must remind my subject, Mr. Knox, of this. You... You are a wise ruler, madame. I have no fear that you can not easily cope with this strange man. But it will not be long before the young Mary sails from France to claim her throne. She is a young girl, used to the gentle ways of the French court. It is for her, I suggest that we remove this man's disturbance. Surely she will find his rough ways distressing. By the time my daughter arrives in Scotland, Mr. Knox will be a, a forgotten man. And to do him any harm or to, to restrain him now would set up such an uproar in Edinburgh. I cannot think we would have quiet for years to come. It does seem surprising to have no word at all of the Queen Regent reading your letter, John. I know. Yet I know that she received it. The Earl of Glencairn delivered it in person. Perhaps she's planning a reform and is awaiting for the proper opportunity to ask your help. No, I didn't think that. But I did expect to hear some word of it. You're not eating your supper, John. I cannot. There's so much on my mind. What? Are the nobles in Scotland... I could not take my sleep at night if I had their thoughts in my head. I didn't know what you mean. Murder and plots against the life of the Queen Regent. Plans to overthrow the government. Oh. And half of them far more interested in their own little pieces of this kingdom than in the kingdom of God. Yet they profess the reformed faith. Oh, John, I wish they were not your friends. There are treason in danger, your life. Oh, that's not what lies heavy upon my heart. The nobles didn't understand the root of the matter. The time is not right to strike. Overthrow now would only mean confusion in Scotland. There is no man strong enough to lead the whole land, and our rightful queen is only that young girl in France. And if the queen regent were murdered, France would invade. John, you've told me that so often. Why didn't you tell them? I'm not the man to preach politics to the highborn. <gasps> oh, dear. Good evening, Mrs. Knox. Is a Mr. Knox at home? Yes. Come in, Peter Clyde. <laughs> John, a wonderful news for us. Bloody Mary of England has died. The persecutions are over. Oh, thank God. And she dies childless. Elizabeth, her young half-sister, is to be proclaimed queen. Another woman. John, Elizabeth of England follows her father, Henry VIII. She is a Protestant queen. And so we conclude Chapter 11 of Thunder in the Heather, the story of John Knox. This has been another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and is produced in the radio studios of the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago. <laughs>